Uh, Shalom, welcome back. Um, so we left off, Kifa and Clement were having this conversation, and at the end of it, Kifa, or Clement says that he thinks Elohim, that he has Kifa instead of parents. <clears throat> and so then Kifa says, uh, Are you really then alone in your family? And I answered, there are indeed, indeed many uh, and great men of the kindred of Caesar, wherefore Caesar himself gave a wife of his fa own family to my father, who was his foster brother, and of her three sons of us were born. And of her three sons of us were born. Two before me who were twins and very like each other, as my father told me, but I scarcely know either of them or our mother, but bear about with me an obscure image of them as uh, though as through dreams my mother's name was uh matidia matidia and my father's faustus and my brothers one was called faustinius and the other faustinius um then after i their third son was born my mother saw a vision so my father told me which told her that unless she immediate, immediately took away her two sons and left the city of Rome for exile for twelve years, she and they must die in an all-destructive fate. Uh, there's a footnote here. The family names are given in the recognitions. Uh, Methidia, Faustinaeus, the father, Faustinius, and Faustus, the twins. So it's a little dispute between the names there. Why in the world would you name your, your kids <laughs> similar? I don't know. Um, anyway. It says, Therefore my father, being fond of his children and supplying them suitably, suitably for the journey with male and female servants, put them on board ship and sent them to Athens uh, with her to be educated, and kept me alone of his sons with him for his comfort. And for this I'm very thankful that the vision had not ordered me also to depart with my mother from the city of Rome. Uh, then, after the lapse of a year, my father sent money to them in Athens and at the same time to learn how they did. But those who went on this errand did not return. And in the third year, my father, being distressed, sent others in like manner with supplies, and they returned in the fourth year with the tidings that they had seen neither my mother nor my brothers, uh, nor had they ever arrived at Athens, nor had they found any trace of any one of those who were sent set out with them. <sighs> then my father hearing this and being stupefied with excessive grief and not knowing where to go in quest of them used to take me with him to go down to the harbor and inquire of me uh, where any one of them has seen or heard of a shipwreck four years ago. And one turned one place and another another then he inquired whether they had seen the body of a woman with two children cast ashore. And when they told him that they had seen many corpses in many places, my father groaned at the information. <clears throat> but with his bowels yearning, he asked unreasonable questions that he might try and search so great an extent of sea. However, he was pardoned, pardonable because <sighs> through affection toward uh, those whom he was seeking for, he fed on vain hopes. And at last, placing me under guardians and leaving me at Rome, when I was twelve years old, he himself, weeping, went down to the harbor and went on board ship and set out for the search, or set out upon the search. And from that day till this, I have neither received a letter from him, nor do I know whether he is alive or dead, but I rather suspect that he is dead somewhere, either overcome by grief or perished by shipwreck. And the proof of that is that it is now the twelfth, the twentieth year that I have heard no true intelligence concerning him. So he said um, he was what twelve? Yeah, he it's twelve plus twenty, so he's thirty-two years old. Well, he's quite a bit older than I thought he was, but he said that he's uh, you know doesn't trust himself <laughs> to. To not go after women, you know, he's only thirty. He's thirty-two. I was thinking he's probably like twenty-two. Um, but Kifa, hearing this, wept uh, through sympathy and immediately said to the gentleman, 
who were present, if any worshiper of Elohim had suffered these things, such as this man's father had suffered, he would have immediately assigned the cause of it to be his worship of Elohim, ascribing it to the wicked one. Thus also is the lot of the wretched Gentiles to suffer. And we worshippers of Elohim know it not, but with good reason I call them wretched, because here they are ensnared, and the hope that is thine they uh, obtain not. But those who in the worship of Elohim suffer affliction, suffer them for the expiation of their transgressions. When Kepha thus spoke, and a certain one amongst us ventured to invite him in the name of all, that next day early in the morning he should sail to Aratus, an island opposite, distant. I suppose not quite thirty stadia, for the purpose of seeking two pillars of vine wood that were there, and that were of very great girth. Therefore the uh, indulgent Kepha consented, saying, when you leave the boat, do not go many of you together to see the things that you desire to see, for I do not wish that the attention of the inhabitants should be turned to you. <clears throat> and so we sailed, and in a short time arrived at the island. Then landing from the boat, we went to the place where the vinewood pillars were, and along with them, we looked at several of the works of Phidias. So they're essentially uh, turning aside for a sightseeing mission if I understand it right um, it says but Kepha alone did not think it worthwhile to look at the sites that were there but noticing a certain woman sitting outside before the doors begging constantly for his support he said to her "O oh woman is any of your limbs defective that you submit to such disgrace I mean that of begging and do not rather work with the hands which Elohim have given you and procure your daily food <clears throat> but she groaning answered, Would that I had hands able to work, but now they remain only in the form of hands, being dead and rendered useless by my gnawing of them. Then Kepha asked her, What is the cause of your suffering so terribly? And she answered, Weakness of soul and nothing else. For if I had the mind of a man, there was a precipice or a pool where I have should thought where I should have thrown myself and had been able to rest from my tormenting misfortunes. So basically, everyone else went on to uh, see the sights of the island, and Kepha just uh, striking up a conversation with this beggar woman. Then it said, Kepha, what then? Do you suppose, O woman, that those who destroy themselves are freed from punishment? Are not the souls of those who, uh, who die punished with the worst punishment in Hades for their suicide? But she said... Would that I were persuaded that souls are ready to be alive and really found alive in Hades, then I should love death, making light of punishment that I might see, were it not work but for an hour my long for sons. Then said Kepha, What is it that grieves you? I should like to know, O woman. For if you inform me in return of this favor, I shall satisfy, satisfy you that souls live in Hades. And instead of precipice or pool, I shall give you a drug that you may live and die without torment. Then the woman, not understanding what was spoken ambiguously, uh, being pleased with the promise, began to speak thus. Were I to speak in my family and my country, I do not suppose that I should be able to persuade anyone. But of what consequence is it to you to learn this? excepting only that the reason why my anguish I have deadened my hands by gnawing them, yet I shall give you an account of myself so far as it is in your power to learn it, to hear it. I, being very nobly born by the arrangement of a certain man in authority, became the wife of a man who was related to him. And first I had twin sons, and afterwards another son, but my husband's brother, being thoroughly mad, was enamored of wretched me, who exceedingly affected chastity and I wish neither to consent to my lover nor to expose my husband his brother's love of me reason, reason thus that I may neither defile myself by the commission of adultery nor disgrace my husband's bed nor set brother at war against with brother nor subject the whole family which is a great one to the reproach of all as I said I reason that it was best for me to leave the city for some time with my twin, tw twin children until the impure love should cease of him who 
flattered me to my disgrace. The other son, however, I left with his father to remain for comfort uh, to him. So, of course, this sounds a lot like Clement's story that he just told Kepha. <clears throat> so, um, so basically the woman is saying that she, um, her, bro her husband's brother had a crush on her and would not stop um, hitting on her. So now she's like, well, I, you know, I didn't want to give in. I didn't want to disrupt the family. So I figured maybe if we just left the city for a little while and gave the gave her brother-in-law time to calm down, uh, cool as jets, so to speak, that then uh, she might be able to go back and everything would be okay. It says, however, that matters might be arranged. I resolved to fabricate a dream to the effect that someone stood by me at night and thus spoke, O woman, straight away, leave the city with your twin children, for for some time until I should charge you to return hither. Otherwise, you forthwith shall die miserably with your husband and all your children. And so I did, for as soon as I told my false dream to my husband, he, being alarmed, sent me off by ship to Athens with my two sons and with slaves, maids, and abundance of money to educate the boys. Until, said he, it shall please the griever of the oracle that you may return to me. But, wretched that I am, while sailing with my children, I was driven by the fury of the winds into these regions, and the ship having gone to pieces in the night, I was wrecked. And all the rest having died, my unfortunate self alone was tossed by a great wave and cast upon a rock. And while I sat upon it in my misery, I was prevented by the hope of finding my children alive from throwing myself into the deep then, when I could easily have done it, having my soul made drunk by the waves. So she was uh, on her way to Athens, shipwreck. And as far as she knows, her twin sons are dead. But when the day dawned, I shouted aloud and howled miserably and looked around, seeking for the dead bodies of my hapless children. Therefore the inhabitants took pity on me, and seeing me naked, they first clothed me and then sounded the deep, seeking for my children. And when they found nothing of what they sought, some of the hospitable women came to me to comfort me, and one of them told me her own misfortunes, that I might obtain comfort from the occurrences of similar misfortunes. But this only grieved me the more, for I said that I, shall, that I was not so wicked that I could take comfort from the misfortunes of others. And so, when many of them asked me to accept their hospitality, a certain poor woman, with much, much urgency, constrained me to come to her cottage, saying to me, Take courage, woman. For my husband, who was a sailor, also died at sea, while he was still in the bloom of his youth. And ever since, um, though, though many have asked me in marriage, I have preferred living as a widow, regretting the loss of my husband. But we shall have in common whatever we both earn with our hands. So, you know, shipwreck, her twin sons are missing, and she uh, gets taken in by this uh, other old or uh, this this other widow and not to len lengthen out unnecessary details i went to live with her on account of her love to her husband and not long after my hands were de uh, debilitated by my gnawing on them and the woman who had taken me in being wholly seized by some malady is confined to the house since then the former compassion of the woman has declined and i and the woman of the house are both both of us helpless for a long time I have sat here, as you see, begging, and whatever I get I convey to my fellow sufferer, sufferer for our support. Let this suffice about my affairs. For the rest, what hinders you fulfilling of your promise to give me the drug, that I may give it to her also, who desires to die, and thus I also, as you said, shall be able to escape from life. When the woman thus spoke, Kepha seemed to be in suspense on account of the many reasonings. But I came up and said, I have been going about seeking you for a long time, and now what is it? What is in hand? But Kepha ordered me to lead the way and wait for him at the boat. And because there was no gainsaying when he commanded, I did as I was ordered. But Kepha, as he afterwards related to the, the whole matter being stuck in his heart with some suspicion, 
inquired the woman, saying, Tell me, O woman, your family and your city, and the names of your children, and presently I shall give you the drug. But she, being put under constraint, and not wishing to speak, yet being eager to obtain the drug, cunningly said one thing for another. And so she um, said that she was an Ephesian, and her husband a Sicilian, and in like manner she changed the name of her three children. The Kepha, supposing that she spoke the truth, said, Alas, O woman, I thought this day was to bring you great joy, suspecting that you were a certain person of whom I was thinking, and whose affairs I have heard and accurately know. But she adjured him, saying, Tell me, I entreat you, that I may know, uh, is there any woman, is there among women anyone more wretched, wretched than myself? Then Kepha, not knowing that she had spoken falsely uh, through pity towards her, began to tell her the truth. There was a certain young man in attendance upon me, uh, thirsting after the discourses on religion, a Roman citizen who told me on how that, uh, having a father and two twin brothers, he has lost sight of them all. For, says he, the mother, as my father related to me, having seen a vision, left for Rome for this time with her twin children, lest she should perish by an evil fate, and having gone away with them, she cannot be found, and her husband, the young man's father, having gone in search of her, he also cannot be found. When Kepha thus spoken, the woman who had listened attentively swooned away as if in stupor, but Kepha approached her and caught hold of her and exhorted her to restrain herself, um, persuading her to confess what was the matter with her. But she, being powerless in the rest of her body as through intoxication, turned her head round, being able to sustain the greatness of hope for joy and rubbing her face. Uh, where, says she, is this youth? And he, now seeing through the whole affair, said, Tell me first, uh, for otherwise you cannot see him. Then she earnestly said, I am that youth's mother. Then said, Kepha, what is his name? And she said, Clement. And Kepha said, It is the same. And he, and he it was that spoke to me a little while ago, whom I ordered to wait for me in the boat. And she, falling at Peter's feet, entreated him to make haste to come to the boat. Then Kepha, if you will keep terms with me, I shall do so. And she said, I will, I will do anything, only show me my only child. For I shall seem to, to see in him my two children who died here. Then Kepha said, When you see him, be quiet until we depart from the island. And she said, I will. Uh, so basically, they've determined that this woman now is, you know, Clement's long-lost mother. <clears throat> Kepha therefore took her by the hand and led her to the boat. But I, when I saw him leading the woman by the hand, laughed, and approaching, offered to lead her instead of him to his honor. But as soon as I touched her hand, she gave a motherly shout and embraced me violently, and eagerly kissed me as, I, uh, as her son. But I, being ignorant of the whole affair, shook her off as a mad woman. But through my respect to Kepha, I checked myself. But Kepha said, Alas, what are you doing, my son Clement, shaking off your real mother? But I, when I heard this, wept, and falling down by my mother, who had fallen, I kissed her. For as soon as this was told me, I in some way recalled her appearance indistinctly. Then great crowds ran together to see the beggar woman, telling one another that her child had recognized her, and that he was a son of a, uh, he was a man of consideration. Then when we were, uh, we would have straightway left the island with my mother, she said to us, my much longed for son, it is right that I should bid farewell to the women who the woman who entertained me, who being poor and wholly debilitated, lies in the house. And Kepha hearing this, and all the multitude who stood by, admired the good disposition of the woman. And immediately Kepha ordered some persons to go and bring the woman on her couch. As soon as the couch was brought and set down, Kepha said in the hearing of the whole multitude, If I be a herald of the truth, in order that the faith of the bystanders, that they may know that there is one Elohim who made the world, let her straightway rise uh, whole. And while Kepha was thus speaking, the woman arose, healed, and fell down before Kepha and kissed her dear associate and said, and asked her what it all meant. Then she briefly detailed to her the whole business of the recognition to the astonishment of the hearers. Then also my mother, seeing the hostess cured, entreated that she herself might also obtain healing. And his, he placed his hand upon her and cured her also. Um... And Kefing, having discourse concerning Elohim and service 
and the service according to him, he concluded as follows, If anyone wishes to learn these things accurately, let him come to Antioch, where I have resolved to remain some length of time and learn the things that pertain to his salvation. For if you are familiar with uh, leaving your country for the sake of trading or for warfare and coming to far off places, you should not be unwilling to go three days journey for the sake of eternal salvation. Then after the address of Kepha presented the woman who had been healed in the presence of all the multitude with a thousand drachmas for her support, giving her in charge to a, good, a certain good man who was the chief of the city and who of his own accord joyfully uh, undertook the charge. Further, having distributed money amongst many other women and thanked those who at any time comforted my, woman, my mother, I sailed away to Antaridus along with my mother and Peter and the rest of our companions, and thus we proceeded to our lodging. Uh, so basically, you know, Kepha, um, you know, they, they found Clement's mother and um, took care of the people in the city and uh, thanked them, and then they're, they're off on their way to Antioch. And when we had arrived and partaken of food and given thanks according to our custom, there being still time, I said to Kepha, My lord Kepha, my mother has done a work of philanthropy in remembering the woman, her hostess. And Kepha answered, Have you indeed, O Clement, uh, thought truly that your mother did a work of philanthropy in respect of her treatment of the woman who took her in after her shipwreck? Or do you have you spoken this word by way of uh, greatly comp complimenting your mother? But if you spoke truly and not by way of compliment, you seem to me not to know what the greatest the greatness of philanthropy is which is affection toward anyone in whatever uh, in respect of his being a man apart from physical persuasion but not even do I venture to call the hostess who received your mother after her shipwreck a philanthropic for she was impelled by pity and persuaded to become the benefactress of a woman who had been shipwrecked, who was grieving for her children, a stranger, naked, destitute, and greatly de deploring her misfortunes. When, therefore, she was in such, such circumstances, who that saw her, um, though he was impious, could but pity her. So that does not seem to me to, that even the stranger receiving woman did a work of philanthropy, but to have been moved to assist her by pity for her innumerable misfortunes. And how much more is it true of your mother when she was in uh, prosperous circumstances and requited her hostess? She did a deed, not of philanthropy, but of friendship. For there is much difference between fr friendship and philanthropy. Because friendship springs from requital. But philanthropy, apart from physical persuasion, loves and benefits every man as he is a man. If therefore while she pitied her hostess, she also pitied and did good to her enemies who had wronged her, she would be philanthropic. But if on account of account she is friendly or hostile, and on account it is hostile or friendly, such a one is the friend of enemy of such quality, not of man as man. So I think he was kind of referring back to Yeshua's teaching about uh, loving your enemies. Um you know, the true charity is even helping those that hate you. Um, you know, loving your enemies, not just loving those that are good to you. Then I answered, "Do you, uh, do you not think then that even the stranger receiver was philanthropic, who did good to a stranger whom she did not know?" And Kepha said, "Compassionate indeed, I can call her, but I dare not call her philanthropic, as just as I cannot call a mother." Uh, philo uh, kinetic for she is prevailed on to have an affection then for them by her pangs and by her rearing of them and the lover also is gratified by the company and enjoyment of his mistress and the friend in return of friendship so also the compassionate man by misfortune however compassionate man is near to the philanthropic and that he is impelled apart from hunting after the receipt of anything to do the kindness. But he is not yet philanthropic. Then I said, By what deeds then can anyone be philanthropic? And Kepha said, Since I see that you are eager to hear what is the work of philanthropy, I shall not object to telling you. Um, 
Okay, I was just reading that. That footnote says that this is this part's not in the recognitions. It says he is a philanthropic man who does good even to his enemies, and that it that it is so. Listen, philanthropy is masculo feminine, and the feminine part of it is called compassion, and the male part is called love to our neighbor. But every man is neighbor to every man, and not merely this man or that. For the good and the bad, the friend and the enemy are alike men. It behooves, therefore, him who practices philanthropy to be an imitator of Elohim, doing good to the righteous and the unrighteous, as Elohim himself vouchsafes his, his son and his heavens to all in the present world. But if you will do good to the good, why not to the evil? Or even will, or even will punish them, you undertake to do the work of a judge. You do not strive to hold by philanthropy. <clears throat> okay. I have to say right here <laughs> that I don't necessarily agree with this. I think that you should definitely do good for the good. But if someone's wicked, I don't see why you should feel obligated to give charity to the wicked. Um, you know, it's just me. And this is part of my own discernment from, from reading this. You know, I, I, it's like this footnote said. There is no parallel to this part of the homilies in the recognition. So, um, these, this could represent something that was added later after the fact. Um, there is a difference between loving your enemies and praying for your enemies. Um, or if you know your enemies are in a bad spot, to, to help them and show them kindness. <clears throat> but, um, but I think you should always help the righteous before you help the wicked. <clears throat> it says, Then I said, Then even Elohim, who, as you teach us, is at some point to judge, is not philanthropic. Then I said, Kepha, you assert a contradiction, for because he shall judge on that very account, he is philanthropic. For he who loves and compassionates uh, those who have been wronged avenges those who have wronged them. Then I said, If then... I also do good to the good and punish the wrongdoers in respect to the, their injuring men. Am I not philanthropic? And Kepha answered, If alone with knowledge you also use authority to judge, you would do this rightly on account of your having received authority to judge those whom Elohim made. And on account of your knowledge, infall infallibly judging some as the righteous and condemning some as unrighteous, then I said, you have spoken rightly and truly, for it is impossible for anyone who, is, who has not knowledge to judge rightly. For sometimes some per persons seem good, though they perpetrate wickedness in secret, and some good persons are conceived to be bad through the accusation of their enemies. But even if one judges having the power of torturing and examining, not even so should he, be all, should he altogether judge righteously. For the same persons have being murderers, have sustained the tortures and have come off as innocent, while others, being innocent, have been able to sustain the tortures but have confessed falsely against themselves and have been punished as guilty. Um, they say, Kepha, these things are ordinary. Now I hear what is greater. There are some men whose sins or good deeds are partly their own and partly those of others, but it is right that each one uh, be punished for his own sins and rewarded for his own merits. But it is impossible for anyone except a prophet who alone has omnipotence to know with respect to the things that are done by anyone which are his own and which are not, for all are seen as done by him. Then I said I would not, <clears throat> I would learn how some of men's wrongdoings or right doings are their own and some belong to others. Uh, then Kepha answered, "The prophet of truth has said, good things must, good things must needs come, and blessed, said he, is he by whom they come. In like manner, evil things must need come, but woe to him through whom they come. Um, but if evil things come by means of good of evil men, and good things are brought by good men, it must needs be that each man as his own to be either good or evil, or good or bad, and proceeding." From what he has proposed, in order that the uh, in order to the coming of the subsequent good or evil, 
which being of his own choice are not arranged but by the providence of Elohim to come from him. This being so, it is the judgment of Elohim that he who, as by combat, comes through all misfortune and is found blameless. He is uh, deemed worthy of eternal life for those whom by their own will continue in goodness are tempted by those who continue in evil by their own will, being pers uh, persecuted, hated, slandered, plotted against, struck, cheated, accused, tortured, disgraced, suffering, all these things by which it seems reasonable that they should be enraged and stirred up to vengeance. So basically it sounds like, uh, if I understand what Keith is saying, he's saying, look, you know, if you can come through, somebody's bringing evil to you, and if you can bear that evil without being vindictive and seeking after revenge, from them that that in itself proves you are worthy of eternal life. Like it is, he's basically saying it's like a test. So you know, evil things must come, but woe to him through whom they come. So in other words, Elohim's going to punish that person for you. You don't have to stir up vengeance against this person. If I understand what he's saying, I could be misinterpreting him. But that's what I think that Keith is saying. <clears throat> but the master, knowing that those who wrongfully do these things are guilty by means of their former sins, and that the spirit of wickedness works these things by means of the guilty, has counseled to compassionate men as they are men, and being the instruments of wickedness through sin, in this counsel he has given his uh, disciples as claim in philanthropy, and as much as in us lies to absolve the wrongdoers from condemnation, that is, as it were, the temperate may help the drunken by prayers, fasting, and benedictions, not resisting, not avenging, unless they should compel them to sin more. But when a person is condemned by anyone to suffer, it is not, un is not, it is not reasonable for him to be angry with him by whose means the suffering comes, for he ought to reason that if he had not ill-used him, yet because he was to be ill-used, he must have suffered it by means of another. Why then should I be angry with the dispenser when I was condemned at all events to suffer? But yet further, if we do this if we do these same things to the evil on pretense of revenge, we who are good to do the very things that the evil do, accepting that they do them first and we second, and as I said, we ought not to be angry as knowing that the providence of Elohim, the evil punish the good. Those, therefore, who are bitter against their punishers sin as disdaining the messengers of Elohim, but those who honor them and set themselves in opposition to those who think to injure them are pious toward Elohim and has thus decreed. Okay, so he, I, I'm understanding what Keith is saying a little bit better now. Okay, so he's saying that um, good things have to come and blessed is he by whom they come, and in like manner evil things must come, but woe to him through whom they come. So he's saying that if evil things have to come, if we're preordained for evil things, then it makes no sense for us to get upset with the messenger of evil. In other words, if it wasn't this person doing it, it would be someone else. And so there's no point in getting, if, if Elohim is going to ordain us to suffer a certain fate, then whether it's coming by this this person or someone else, we were still going to get that fate. So therefore, it makes no no sense to be upset with the person that offended us because if they didn't do it, someone else would. I think that's what's trying to be um, articulated here. I said to those I, uh, to this I answered: those therefore who do wrong are not guilty because they wrong the just by the judgment of Elohim. Then Kepha said, They indeed sin greatly, for they have given themselves to sin. Wherefore, knowing this, Elohim chooses from among them some to punish those who righteously repented of their former sins. For the evil things done by the just before their repentance must be remitted through the punishment. But to the wicked who punish and desire to ill-use them and will not repent, it is permitted to ill-use the righteous for the filling up of their own punishment. For without the will of Elohim, not even a sparrow can fall to the ground. This even 
Uh, thus, even the hairs of the righteous are numbered by Elohim. So, um, so Kephas or Clement saying, so therefore the people who do wrong are not guilty of doing wrong. And Kephas like, oh no, they're they're still guilty, even though they they were destined to follow out, or you know to 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 bring this evil, even though they were kind of chosen to do it by Elohim. He chose them because of their because they were willing to do it. Um, so they still are to be judged. It's just that um, Elohim allows them to persecute the innocent as a way of filling up their punishment. And again, this to me, <laughs> I mentioned earlier, I don't think this is authentic. For one thing, it's saying that Elohim is allowing them to afflict the, the good, the righteous, and to me, I mean, that, that almost falls into what Kepha says elsewhere about um, any, anything written against Elohim that paints Elohim in a negative light is false. So the editors of this book here, the Clementine Homilies, in one of the footnotes it says that they were doubtful that this is authentic. Um, and like I said, I'm doubtful that this is authentic. But... Um, I think we got two more chapters this the end of the homily, so uh, we'll try to go ahead and get through it. I know this is going a little bit long. It says, But he is righteous who, for the sake of what is reasonable, fights with nature. For example, if it is for example, it is natural to all who love those who love them. But the righteous man tries also to love his enemies and to bless those who slander him and even to pray for his enemies and to uh, compassionate those who do him wrong. Wherefore also he remains from doing wrong and blesses those who curse him and pardon those who strike him and submits to those who persecute him and salutes those who do not salute him. Shares such things as he has with those who have not, persuades him um, that is angry with him, conciliates his enemy, exhorts the disobedient, instructs the unbelieving, comforts the mourners. Being distressed, he endures. Being ungratefully treated, he is not angry, but having devoted himself to love his neighbor as himself, he is not angry, afraid of poverty, but becomes poor by sharing his possessions with those who have none. I'm going to highlight this one. This is an Ebionite doctrine. So even if the rest of it's spurious, I think it's odd that that's included in this questionable section. It says, but neither does he punish the sinner, for he who loves his neighbor as himself, as he knows that when he is, has sinned, he does not wish to be punished, so neither does he punish those who sin. He wishes to be praised and blessed and honored and to have all his sins forgiven. Thus he does to his neighbor, loving him, him, him as himself. In one word, what he wishes for himself, he wishes also for his neighbor. But this is the law of Elohim and the prophets. This is a doctrine of truth, and the perfect love toward every man is the male part of philanthropy, but the female part of it is, is compassion. There is, uh, that is, to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick, to take in the stranger, to show herself to, and to help the, to the utmost of her power him who is in prison, and in short, to have compassion on him who is in misfortune. We got several footnotes. Let's see what they say. Oh, it's just scripture references. Uh, it says, but I, hearing this, said these things indeed it is impossible to do, but, that, but to do good to enemies, bearing all their insolences. I do not think and possibly be in human nature. Then Kepha answered, you have said truly, for the philanthropy being the cause of immorality is given for much. Then I said, how is it possible to get in the mind? Then Kepha answered, O beloved Clement, the way to get it is this, if anyone be persuaded that enemies ill-using for a time those whom they hate but become the cause of them, cause to them of deliverances from evil punishment, and forthwith he will ardently love them as benefactors. But the way I get it, O oh dear Clement, Clement, is but one, which is the fear of Elohim. For he who fears Elohim cannot indeed from the first love his neighbors himself, for such an ardor does not occur to the soul, but by the fear of Elohim he is able to do the things of those who love him. 
uh, and thus, while he does the deeds of love, the bride love is. And as it were, brought to the bridegroom fear, and thus this bride being, being both, and thus this bride being both philanthropic thoughts makes her prosper, pros, possessor makes her possessor immortal as an accurate image of Elohim, which cannot be subject in its nature to corruption. Thus, while he expounded to us the doctrine of philanthropy, the evening having set in, we turn to sleep. So, uh, I guess what Keith is saying is, you know, Clement brings up, like, wait a minute, this is not human nature. And Keith, uh, if I'm understanding him right, he's saying, well, you know, that's the point. It's not human nature. It's um, The only way you can get this is through love of Elohim and through fearing Elohim. And it's because you fear Elohim that that's what it is that, that um, gives you the ability to not lash out against those when they wrong you. It's because... Your, your love and your fear of Elohim is greater than your need to get vengeance. Or at least that's what I think he's saying. Again, you read it for yourself and see what, see what understanding you come to. All right, well, that's the end of Homily 12. Uh, this video has been a little bit longer than I meant for it to, but um, I knew we were almost finished with the homily, so I was trying to get through in two videos. All right, well, thanks for listening. Uh, shalom, and uh, I'll continue this next time. Bye.